you know it? Wouldn't you know it? What a what a dumbass idiot I just did. What the fuck? That's a video. I don't want my video. I swear to God. I hit the wrong button. And I got fucking screwed up here. Oh my god, what in the fuck is wrong? That's what's wrong because fucking Twitch wants to put an ad in and I can't I can't bring it up on my webpage. Like what the hell is wrong with this? I don't fucking believe this sh fucking bullshit is happening right now. Finally. Give me my damn webpage. Alright. Now back to abnormal. So. We got... Some stuff here. I have no idea what this is or what these people did to it. Obviously, it's it's extremely obvious to me that this music is not related to the fractals, because look at the complexity in this picture. Okay, you'd hear nothing but noise. So we're gonna listen to this just for kicks and see what the hell it. I mean, anybody could make music to make a fucking fractal video and make music, you know. Yeah, that's obviously not related to the fractal. This is all bullshit here. What is this? This is the same thing. Electro what is this here? How great is it that we get to tell How great is it that I get to shut your ass up and all I gotta do is watch your ass? I don't give a shit about fucking bullshit ads. Hey, it is what it is. I'll show you something pretty amazing, I think. It's the musical equivalent of a fractal. Oh, the mathematical asshole. concept often represented in geometric art that explores... Okay, so here's the thing. It's going to be fucking noise. Well, that's obviously not a fucking fractal. Uh, crappy synth sound is playing the first four measures of Smash Mouth's All-Star. Somebody once told me the world is gone. If we look at the piano roll, we see that it's actually made up of MIDI data comprising 16,515 individual notes whizzing by at thousands of notes per second. We can zoom in closer, so to speak, using this feature in Ableton Live, which lets you have the tempo of a MIDI clip. So now let's listen to this, but exponentially slower every time. signal Somebody once told me the world is gonna roll me So yes, you heard that correctly. This version of Smash Mouth's All-Star yields Smash Mouth's all-Star when it slowed down to about 1,000 times the original speed. How did I put this together, and why does it work? Well, before we get into it, I strongly recommend that you watch this video, my video on harmonic polyrhythms. In a nutshell, that video argues that, one, since... That, that was actually, believe it or not, that was actually interesting, because the idea of fractals is that the closer that you zoom in each time, it repeats itself. Uh, in other words, you've got a small section that sounds the same as the big section. So there's actually some truth in this video. Notes in the major scale relate to one another by simple pitch frequency ratios. Two, since polyrhythms are also measured in simple ratios. Three, when you speed rhythm up, you get pitches. Four, therefore, notes and melodies are just polyrhythms sped up really, really quickly. Are you with me so far? Well, there's gonna no. be some math involved explained by somebody who is not a mathematician, so you have been warned. 
Okay, so the first step here is to sequence the first couple bars of All Star in the piano roll. We will think of this full clip of notes as our basic rhythmic pulse. Now we're gonna reference this chart from Wikipedia of intervals and their corresponding pitch ratios. We'll use these to mark up the sheet music of All Star as a reference. So the first interval, as it's related back to the root, is a fifth. So it has a ratio of three to two. The next interval is a major third. So it has a ratio of five to four, oh et cetera, et cetera. God, Normally, oh these ratios describe pitch frequencies measured in Hertz or cycles per second. Today, these ratios will describe all star frequencies. How many times your ear will hear the first four measures of all star by Smash Mouth per second? Yes, this is an actual thing that I spent a lot of time on. What am I doing with my life? Okay. Let's do it. We're gonna need to figure out how many all-star clips we need to cram in within a given amount of space so that our ear will hear it as one continuous note when we speed it up. So in order to do that, we're going to need to find whole number integers that relate to one another by the ratios that describe the frequencies that we mentioned beforehand. <laughs> now I'm sure there's some fancy math that we could do to calculate those integers, but the I Wikipedia didn't understand list that we were referencing earlier already said. has them. 27 relates to 24 by a ratio of nine to eight, 30 relates to 24 by a ratio of five to four, etc., etc. So what we need to do now is lay out groups of all-star clips based upon the integer that relates to each individual <clears throat> note from the melody. So Damn. the first note is the Earphone root, so it will out. get 24 all-star clips. The next note is the fifth, so it will get 36 all-star clips. So in order for these to be ratios of frequency, they need to occur in the same amount of time. They have to have the rhythmic ratio of 36 to 24 or three to two. Fortunately, Ableton Live makes this really easy to program. It would be fairly complicated otherwise. All I have to do is consolidate these clips using Control J, select the notes using Control A, and then drag the notes over to fit 24 bars. This is 36 all-star clips being smushed within the span of 24, so now the rhythmic ratio is three to two. If we listen to the clip for the second note, the fifth, we now hear that the all-star melody is going a little bit faster than the first one. If we were to write out this process in standard notation, it would look like this, which is fairly complicated, but it is possible to do this without Ableton Live's nifty feature. So we're basically gonna go through this process with every single individual note from All Star. The next note is the third in the key, so it will get 30 all-star clips. The next note is the third again, so let's just copy and paste that. However, it's twice the length of the preceding notes. It's a quarter note in the melody, so let's double the entire thing so it'll take longer when we actually speed it up. We're basically just gonna keep doing this. Referencing back and forth to the table and the sheet music is actually a really straightforward process. Okay. Soon we'll have fractalized the entire melody. Let's listen to it, and then let's start slowly speeding it up so that we'll hear it more and more as it pitch. The ramifications of this I think are pretty interesting because you could conceivably make any melody by sequencing versions of itself to generate itself. This sort of self-reference and recursion is explored quite heavily in Douglas Hofstetter's book Gödel Escher Bach, and I really strongly recommend that book if you found this video at all interesting. I got the idea for this video from a Reddit thread where somebody suggested that this might be possible, like a musical quine. A quine, by the way, is a bit of computer code which generates its own source code as its only output. Well, it turns out it is possible and something that I think is quite cool. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching uh, this video. Yeah, so anyway, um... That seems to be... That seems to be a little bit more complicated than he was. So what he's doing there is he's taking music itself and duplicating it at a lower level and then reproducing it at a higher level. That's that's an idea of, all right, this, this bird is gonna really get on my nerves. You, my friend, are going back to your little Hide out, you little shitbox. 
my god, are you kidding me? Alright. Now I've got another problem, damn it. Hang on just a second, I got a problem, I gotta fix. Fucking bullshit, I'm telling you. <sighs> Why? Why me? I'd like to be able to just concentrate on something. You get to the end of it, you know? <coughs> I just have to, uh, just have to check something out here just to make sure that we're all kosher. I got a lovely hairdo. I got a lovely bushy bond hairdo, don't I? <laughs> uh, let's break, knock that off and bring this shit back here. Web page. Uh, okay, you can just drop that again. So, but what I'm wanting to do is I want to create a fractal and then, um, but this was an interesting, this wasn't, this was interesting to watch, needless to say. Wait, he had some other shit up there too, didn't he? What else did he have? He had, what is this here? You know, I'd like to be able to just... Oh my freaking god. Two thousand subscribers on this channel, which got me thinking, what does the sound... When you zoom into the piano roll, you see thousands and thousands of notes, each belonging to a smaller iteration of the solo. This is an example of something I call a musical Fractal, a demonstration of the polyrhythmic nature of melody. If you want to learn more about the math and technique of creating your own fractals, definitely watch my video on fractals where I demonstrate the whole process on a simple melody. Some. It's basically an elaborate shit post, but I think it does a decent job of demonstrating an idea that every crusty old jazz man will tell you. Melody is like the same thing as rhythm, man. The song Giant Steps was composed as an improvisatory vehicle for John Coltrane to explore something called multitonic systems. He centers built in major thirds equal distances from one another. We'll take short clips of his recorded <laughs> solo and then we'll speed those clips up 4,000 times their original speed. These MIDI clips will be going by so fast that your ear will not be able to perceive the individual notes and just hear the whole thing as a waveform. This is similar to how a wavetable synthesizer works. Because the MIDI clips are all of the same melody, they will have the necessary periodicity to produce pitch when they're sped up. If they were all different melodies, it would just sound like noise. When the sound of the clips hits your inner ear, a structure called the basilar membrane will vibrate in sympathy with the total number of clips hitting it per second. Tiny hair cells in the inner ear will convert that acoustic information into electrical impulses that the brain can then interpret, just the same way that a microphone will pick up sound waves to be either amplified or recorded. What happens next, I think, is pretty incredible and also not that well understood. Our ears can do math really quickly. I'm afraid we need to use math. Let's take these two sine waves. One vibrates at 520 times per second and the other vibrates at 650 times per second. Your ear automatically calculates the ratio between the two of them as five to four. This is the interval of a major third. Because five against four is a simple ratio with simple integers, our ear accepts it as a pleasing sound. Our ears automatically do what our conscious brains might have to labor over, quickly calculate ratios between two separate pitches. And boy, can they do it quickly. Thousands of 
notes per second can be processed by the brain with the right sort of math behind it. This particular musical fractal, the one based on the John Coltrane solo, is a little bit harder to put together than the one for All Star, just because it uses all 12 notes of the chromatic scale. We'll need to find whole integer ratios that relate back to a root for all 12 oh, notes wait, of the chromatic just a scale. Here. Wait, wait, hold the fort. Why can't I do, um, why can't I do a visual on this web page? I've got web page. I should have. Vi I got visuals Twitch, which should be the other thing. Well, actually, well, yeah. Doesn't that that's that's a Twitch thing? Let me let me do this web page. Maybe I could rename that to web page visual. Oh, visuals Twitch. Yeah, but that's the same. Is that the same? No, it's in a different position. Oh man, what if this was over here? Holy shit. Wait, does that... I gotta redo this all over again. Visuals Twitch. <coughs> going on? Why isn't it showing up here? Oh, that's just not good. That's not going to work. I can't do it. Um, I'll just have to... I'll have to realign the web page. Wait, why can't I just use visuals? I'm just going to use visuals and realign it that way. Because we're going to be looking at a few web pages. I guess. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. It's not the whole web. It's not the whole web page. Hmm. Close enough, I guess. I just shove that over there in the corner. order to find the harmonic polyrhythms. Definitely check out this video if you haven't already. Unfortunately, unlike last time, we cannot just simply look up this information on Wikipedia. Now I'm sure there's some fancy math that we could do to calculate those integers, but the Wikipedia list that we were referencing earlier already has them. The Wikipedia list that I referenced earlier was just looking at seven notes of the just intonated diatonic scale, not the chromatic scale. This problem definitely stumped me because, well, I'm a musician and to not a mathematician. Refreshing myself on basic algebra on Khan Academy so only got five, me so six. far. But then I thought, well, maybe the answer lies in the harmonic series. Well. Maybe the answer lies in the harmonic series. The harmonic series, also known as the overtone series, is based upon simple multiples of a fundamental. So if your fundamental uh, is 100 hertz, the second harmonic will be 200 hertz. The third harmonic will be 300 hertz. Just take whatever the frequency of a note is, multiply it by a number, and then you get that number harmonic. So easy, even a musician can do it. We hear all of the different harmonics as different pitches and intervals in relationship back to the root. Our brains process the differences between harmonics as musical intervals. 
The ratios between two of them create a harmonic interval. For example, the distance between the fifth harmonic and the fourth harmonic create a five to four ratio, or the ratio of a major third that we heard earlier. Major thirds are in our system of Western harmony, but other intervals aren't, like the distance between the seventh harmonic and the fourth harmonic. These intervals between notes get smaller and smaller as you go higher, but they never stop. The harmonic series, in theory, goes on into infinity. So if we just went up high enough, we could find all of the 12 notes of the chromatic scale and then apply it to our musical fractal. All we would need to know is just the numbers of these harmonics. And then those numbers are the total number of MIDI clips we'll need in order to create our chromatic giant steps solo. In trying to figure all this stuff out, I found an interesting paper by the bassoonist Johnny Reinhard, which proposes a system of tuning based upon eight octaves of the harmonic series all the way up to the 256 sixth harmonic. It lists all of the unusual intervals you can create. Some of my favorites include the howling dominant, the hyper leading tone major seventh, and my personal favorite, the almost major sixth. You are so close, major sixth. You are so close. In all of this, though, we can find pretty close approximations of all 12 notes of the equal tempered system. I took these and then created this table of interval ratios. The numbers on the right are how many MIDI clips of the first eight measures of John Coltrane's solo on giant steps we will need to create and play back within a given amount of time so that when we speed it up, we'll hear that note. So if we play 57 MIDI clips within the span of 32 MIDI clips, it will one, create a crazy complicated 57 to 32 polyrhythm when we play it slowly, and two sound like a minor seventh when we speed it up. I went about manipulating large numbers of MIDI clips and recombining oh them based God. upon all of the individual notes from the John Coltrane solo. When we start speeding it up, you slowly start to hear the horror of notes recombine into the solo. This is a testament to your ear's incredible ability to perceive ratios between frequencies. <laughs> I'm, I'm lost as to what he's trying to... Okay, that's... So there was a point there in the middle where there wasn't any recreation of the music, but then as it got towards the end... So our ear calculates these ratios almost instantly. But we don't really know why this occurs. Maybe. We don't really seem to have that same ability when it comes to light frequencies, for example. Consider this versus this. Noticeable for sure, but not really jarring. But if you listen to this versus this, because our brains detect a more complicated ratio in the second example, our ears immediately perceive it as being more dissonant than the first example. This fine tuning of our ability to do Oral math is why the Coltrane fractal works. The range of human hearing is about 10 octaves, from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Certain marine mammals, like the harbor porpoise, can hear up to 180,000 hertz. Or, if we wanted to program it, 180,000 Coltrane solos per second. Musical perception is a pretty amazing thing, because of how unique it is to the physical makeup of our bodies. We Okay, well, he's getting into some other shit here. That's not really what I wanted to uh, get get into here. Decreed. Uh, subharmonic music. All right. Well, let's just back up again here. Flame fractal visualizer. What's this? New space music visualizer. Waveform filter effect created with FM, MPG, and the a vectorscope filter function. 
set to Brian Eno's new space music. What the hell is the vector scope folder? Damn it. Now, see, now I can't, everything's going to be maxed out here. Let's see what the hell this fucking thing is. Vectorscope. A vectroscope. What are they doing? Spelling it wrong or something? I think he spelt it wrong. FM MPG vectorscope and web waveform. I think I think there's something wrong there. I'm sorry we have to go through these stupid ads. Well, there's no music here. Oh, this is just confusing. Just looking up some stuff here. It's not what I'm wanting to find. Let me go back another step because this is just too confusing. Well, all right, let's look at, let's look for fractal music here. Erica Nice. Why do two different people have the same picture on here? <coughs> Let's find out. Simplified version of Coke's Snowflake Fractal is turned into music, etc., etc. I composed this this year, 1991, was a course electronic music by Paul Pauli Lane and Helskin Sinky, whatever the hell it is. The name is for sure for six cents boost. No, don't. Take that, Adam Neely. Uh, somebody was talking against the guy that I was just watching the video from. Now, what's this? Wait, what the hell? This is the same. This is from the same person. But over here it says Erica Nice. Why is it different? is going on here. Music generated by a fractal algorithm, fractalmusicmachine.com, music and visualization software.
above is the score for Cary geometric clouds. Time is represented horizontally, and the place to start a clip of a source track is represented vertically. What's this archive? January 2021. Impossible music. is a musical puzzle that was first posed by the Italian mathematician Giovanni Battista Benedetti in 1585. And the music is technically impossible because what we can do is multiply their ratios. Now, to add intervals, what we can do is multiply their ratios. A major third to derive our C, we get the ratio of 27 to 20, which is not the four to three ratio for C that we got before. It's a little bit sharper. This interval, by the way, has a technical name, and that is the acute fourth. So good for you, C. You're looking pretty acute. So even though the numbers for the second set of pitches look more complicated, they will sound more in tune because they were tuned to that upper A that was being held over. The coup de gras of Benedetti's puzzle arrives on the last beat. This is where the sword is twisted. The soprano A resolve is down to a G. G is a perfect fifth up from C. And if we measure the interval of a perfect fifth up from C's 27 to 20 ratio, we get a value of 81 to 40 for that final G, which is a little bit higher than that octave G that we started with. The distance between these two Gs is about 21 cents, roughly a fifth of an equal tempered semitone. It's called a syntonic comma. There is a whole wonderful wide world of these minor tuning discrepancies called commas. If you wanna learn a little bit more, go check out 12 Tones, excellent video on them. But the pitch rising effect of this comma pump or comma drift is not merely academic. It's actually bedeviled musicians for many, many centuries now. In his book, The Fundamentals of Musical Composition, composer Arnold Schoenberg would write of how natural semitones differ in size from the tempered, a fact which causes choirs to get off pitch. It's very common for choirs singing a cappella without any instruments to end in a different pitch space from where they began through no fault of their own. It's actually built into the mathematics of many pieces of music. If they sing perfectly in tune, the pitch starts to drift. But if they fudge the tuning a little bit, the pitch might stay stable, but the tuning will suffer. That's the cosmic joke. We can never have it both ways. You can't actually have mathematically pure music without the pitch drifting. There have been many attempts at solving some of the problems that Benedetti's puzzle aimed to illuminate. He actually wrote several different puzzles, each showing different ways that you could have comma drift using just intonation. The solution that the modern world has kind of settled on is something called 12-tone equal temperament. The commas have been tempered out of the system. So we can play in every key, the pitch doesn't drift, but the tuning is not quite perfect. And so this is why Benedetti's oh, puzzle is. Oh, oh, I understand. It, the light bulb just hit, just struck. So if I go from one octave to five octaves up higher, the tuning, in order for it to sound the same, in order for it to have the same pitch, the tuning has to be off. Mm. 
this is something more about the intricacies of music that um that I want to get into. So in order for me to understand that, I would have to take the sound from my keyboard, run that into um, my frequency meter, and I could do that with this keyboard because I have the ability to make uh, an individual sound rather than, than like like a piano might have a whole bunch of harmonics and stuff in there that maybe to hide some of that stuff. Um, so what I'd have to do is I'd have to run a cable. Actually, what I could do is I could grab... I'd have to move some stuff. I don't want to move. Oh, I've got a scope. I could move that scope. No. I'd have to have, let's see, let me think. I have to have a scope with two different. On that one there, I've got a problem with that one scope. It only has one output, or one input that works. I have a frequency counter. I'd have to calibrate those. That would be a that's gonna be a bit of a mess. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I have a better idea. What if we have a program that can measure frequency on the computer? Um, I could do it with the computer. I could do I could do a right and left channel. And then we could see the differences in pitch. Yeah, but I'm not going to program that into... Well... Okay. Let's, let's see what else we've got here. Oh, this is a SoundCloud thing. Watch your ears, huh? Well, I'm not going to listen to that. And that says page not found. About fractal music machine. Hmm. Now shut up. that's a bit of a problem because it's playing I don't know what it's doing actually
Yeah, this one's just... Oh, this one's using... Okay, so... <coughs> if we look at this picture, the higher up it goes, it's going up in pitch. Oh, you know what it's doing? It's going up an octave. This one sound different. Well, it's kind of. Let me go back to the beginning. Wait, let's go back to here somewhere. Oh. Mm -hmm. That's not an octave. same damn note. <coughs> it's the same note played up here as it's played down here, so something's not right here. It's the same it's playing the same note. Okay, I do not know what's going on here. It makes no sense at all. Okay, now, when we think about what he was talking about, when you go higher in, in pitch, the tuning is off because you want to make the sound the same. If you keep the same tuning, the octave is not going to sound the same. Um, this is a visual representation of something. I, I, I'm thinking it's, it's an accurate representation of a fractal, of the way the fractal would be created. Musically, musically, there's something wrong with it. But we're going to do something here. We're gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up uh, Audacity here. And we're going to record this. And we're going we're gonna to see if we can discover something that it might totally freak the fuck out of me if it works. This is something new. Um, where is this? Can I make this smaller? I screwed that up, didn't I? Alright, um...
I wanna I wanna get this last piece. Oh, he's got something else in here too. Actually, what we'll do is we'll go back to the beginning. We'll go back to right there. Let me record this. Wait, shit, damn it. I gotta go to Audacity. Yeah, it's picking up the microphone. I may have to shut the mic off, let me see. Okay, it's it's picking everything up. Let me, um, I'll turn the microphone off and then we'll do a new, a new track. Oh shit, I don't want to do that. Maybe I just, I just have to get rid of that and record it. Alright, here we go. Let's go back here at the beginning. And then I'm going to jump ahead once I record this. Alright, now we're going to bring up Audacity. Uh, that would be Programs. Visuals, programs. Now this is the recording of the music that we just had, we just heard. And what we're gonna do <coughs> is we are gonna do, we're gonna go to this audio track. Whoops, fuck. I'm going to go to spectrogram. Okay. 
see what this sounds like to you. quite what I was looking for. Shit. I had to sit here and wait. This was the end of that one portion. I'm just messing around with this. It's not, I mean, um, all right, I'm, I'm happy with whatever I saw there, which evidently wasn't. It was pretty much what I was expecting, I guess. Uh, visuals? <coughs> I don't know what that is. This one's kind of interesting. Let's see here. Music and math. Symmetry. Let's look at this one here. We love patterns. We love it when things fall into place, when the last piece of the puzzle fits in, when a piece of music returns triumphantly to the tonic. But we also love to be surprised. We love to see the rules get broken, for the pattern to shift beneath our feet for the puzzle to refuse to fit together until we look at it from a new angle. This tension between pattern and surprise keeps our ears pricked up. It gives us enough to hold on to, but keeps us on our toes. In both mathematics and music, a classic kind of pattern comes from symmetry. We say something is symmetric when there is some way we can transform it that keeps it the same. We look about the same if you flip our image in a mirror. But some of our more distant relatives look the same if you rotate them. Repeating patterns like these intricate Moorish mosaics from the Alhambra in Spain stay the same if we shift them over or if we rotate them. The dodecahedron, one of Plato's favorite things, stays the same if we rotate it. There are symmetries in higher dimensions as well, like this four-dimensional hypercube. The mathematician Emmy Noether discovered that many of the laws of physics are actually symmetries of the universe. <laughs> There's another kind of symmetry in mathematics. Fractals are things that look the same when we zoom in on them, where each part looks like a smaller version of the whole. They show up in all sorts of places, including ferns, coastlines, and this broccoli my daughter brought home from the grocery store. Even simple mathematics can make fractals. Take this triangle of honeycomb and put ones on the outside. Fill in each cell with the sum of the two numbers above it. One plus one equals two, one plus two equals three, and so on. 
Now color the odd numbers black and the even numbers white. What do we get? If we continue the pattern and zoom out, we see a triangle made of three triangles, and each one is a smaller version of the original. Perhaps the most famous fractal is the Mandelbrot set. Zooming in on different areas reveals endless variety, but always with a smaller copy of the entire set hiding deep inside it. Further in you go, though, the Mandelbrot set does get a little bit distorted. See, there it is there. It's a little bit distorted, though. Um, it could be the way the map. A musical fractal is a piece where the theme harmonizes with a slowed down version of itself. That way, the small scale <coughs> structure of the piece is repeated at a larger, grander scale. Johann Sebastian Bach loved to play with symmetry. In his fugues, the theme is repeated many times in different forms. In the fugue we're going to perform tonight, listen for this theme in the horn. Now listen for the upside down version of it in the second trumpet. the slowed down version it in the first trumpet. And the extremely slowed down version in the tuba. Sounds like it's a different key. Now let's hear how he puts it all together, complete with a great uh, visual of this fugue. He's taking the same pattern and putting it in different places and using different instruments. <coughs> okay, well that was somewhat interesting. It's not... Oh, it's not quite what I was looking for. So what I've learned from this is the idea of, uh, let me see if I can, I'm going to bring up a program. I'm going to bring up a program here. Um, I'm going to bring up my paint program. Let's see if I can get this into black. All right, let's see here. Let's drop visuals. Programs. Uh, properties. Let me 
title paint. Bear with me for a moment while I adjust this. Alright, um, let's see, what, let's see if I can explain this. Uh, let's see, let's use that one, actually, use that. Alright, so, we want to draw lines, we're going to use, let's see, let's use uh, yellow. do this well that's not what I wanted to do is it okay it's not supposed to do that let me do another one here Supposed to be in line mode. Um, it's been a while since I've used this. So, what I'm doing here is I'm just going to draw a little graph can't get this quite straight here close enough I guess so this is an XY graph uh, let me just how do I do click out of that um, so we go back to this color now normally Normally what you have is you have, let's say if you have an equation, an equation that says y equals x squared. That curve, that curve looks like, uh, if you, you can see my little mouse thing, it, it starts on the left and it goes down and makes like a little, like an upside down conical section. It goes like this. That's what y equals x squared is. If we have, what if we, we, what if we have something that's related to time, because that's that's what that's what's happening. Um, if you if you just take the formula, you have a picture, but that picture is a slice in time. So. <coughs> If I take a complete, let's say if I take a sine wave, um, I'll draw a little sine wave over here in the upper upper right. It's not going to look very perfect, but hey. That's a sine wave. <coughs> now, the formula for a sine wave is versus time, okay, because... It, it starts at a certain point and it ends at a certain point over a period of time. Now, the other peculiar thing about a sine wave is um, the fact that, well, a, a circle is involved. Okay, so if I draw a circle and then I go to, if I start um I I think if I start here and let's we'll draw a little arrow if I start here and I go around the circle like this 
and I end up over here. Well, actually, there's there's two places here. Three places. So if I go from here up to the top, that's 90 degrees. If I go from from there all the way over to the rear, it's 180 degrees. If I go three quarters of the way around, it's 270. If I go all the way around, it's 360 degrees. Now, that same position on the circle is represented by here, here, and here. The only problem, the only problem, the difference is, is that the sine wave does not look like a perfect circle. It's, 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 it looks different. If it were to look like a perfect circle, um, I mean, honestly, I don't know. So I guess my question would be, if we had a square wave, If we had a square wave that looks like this, that's a square wave. Over a long period of time, it just keeps repeating itself. And then if we go to our marks, um, it says that the marks are supposed to be in the middle. So my question is, <coughs> my question is, that's not the best ar arrow. My question is, what does this square wave look like if if the sine wave trans transmutes to a circle, what does the square wave transmute to? So, what we have, what we have, we have an x y graph. Okay, x y is called. Um, let's see. Let me. Let me. Uh, we we have the red represents the y. <laughs> and the yellow represents the X. So what we would do is we would say um, some function Y equals X. So we got Y and then maybe we would use equals and then we would say uh, over here of Y equals X. We could actually say y equals x squared or whatever. If we say y equals x, then there's going to be a line that goes up diagonally at 45 degrees. Uh, it might even be helpful to put that in there. Um... I wonder where 45 degrees is. Well, 45 degrees is like halfway on that graph, isn't it? Um, let's make a mark. So we make a mark up here. And then we'll make another one down here. And then we'll see, we'll make, we'll make um, a mark here, a little, little shit that's supposed to be green. And then we'll call this one. And we'll call this one. Oops, wrong color. This represents one unit. 
So up here you have a coordinate, um, <coughs> an x y coordinate, which is x equals one, y equals one. So it's one comma one. And let's say that we have a radius. Our our radius of our circle is equal to. It could be equal to one. I'm not really sure. Um, why don't we draw? Let's draw. Actually, let's not. Let's draw this. Let's draw the sine wave. I don't really know how to do that. It's not going to look very good. Uh, say to go here. Just, just, just bear with me here. I didn't draw the line on the other side. This should be a mark down here. <coughs> now, what we have here, what this total length is, is actually called 2 pi. Um, we could say, we could say that the length the length is 2 pi it's it's what it is is you, what we're trying to do is we're converting a cartesian coordinate into radians which is a polar coordinate uh, when i sit back like that it really bugs the crap out of me <coughs> so the total distance between here and here is actually equal to um, let me see if I can put another color in here. This is actually equal to from here. To here. This is called two. This is called 2 pi. It's called 2 pi radians. So in the middle it would be pi. So right here, uh, if I just do a line like that, that's pi. <coughs> now, here's another interesting anecdote. Pi is a number that goes on forever and ever and ever. Okay. And yet, there's an actual, there's a point here where this graph meets this line. And that, that connection is a finite number. How could that possibly be if pi goes on forever and ever and ever? It seems like you never reach that, that limit. Um, now, when there's... There's something else that happens here, which I'm going to just sort of get into. If I take, uh, let's see, if I take another color, uh, let's see, let's take this gray color, and we draw a line like this. We draw a line, oops, shit. Line like that. Get a line like that. That it's not perfect. All right, these gray lines, what these gray lines represent are derivatives. Now, a derivative is a function of what this what this curve is doing. Uh, when it goes from left to right, it's positive. When it goes from right to left, it's negative, or you know something to that nature. Um, and I can't even remember my derivatives or so. You know, you have to take the function of a sine wave. Uh, y equals um, sine of x minus. Um, Omega T, I think it is. 
Uh, but anyway, um, so the, I just want to throw that in there. All right, so if you look at the circle over on the right-hand corner, we define how we define pi in, in a circle as related to how we define pi in a sine wave. <laughs> So let me grab my 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 pi color. And we know that c equals 2 pi r, I think. Um we know that if we go from this point over here over here to all the way up, we know that's well if you go all the way around it's 180 degrees. That's called pi radians. How do we do this? 2 pi r. You've got the circumference. The circumference equals 2 pi r. Um, the radius in this case would be 0.5. No, is it 0.1? <laughs> I don't know. If it goes from there to there, the radius is equal to 1. So, c equals 2 pi r. Let me just go ahead and I'm going to um, I gotta I gotta get something to eat too. What time is it? Two. <coughs> so the circumference equals two pi r. Um is washed out, isn't it? So let me just write this down here. C equals two. C equals 2 pi r, okay? <coughs> now, you also have to think in terms of angles. Um, if we go to the top, it's 90 degrees. If we go to halfway around, it's 180, and then it's 270, and then it's 360. <coughs> now, in polar... Polar math, there's what's called radians. And the complete distance that the sine wave takes is called 2 pi, two pi radians. Um, what am I trying to prove here? I'm not quite sure yet. Uh, let me just go ahead and go back to my website here. And then I'm going to look up... Um, polar coordinates. Wiki. Okay, this is what I'm looking for right here. <coughs> so we've got the radius, and we've got it's really theta. I don't know what, why they're they're putting so much different shit in there. Um, 
if you look at the circle, which is up here, maybe I'm gonna draw a bigger circle on the on the lower left here. This is not part of the graph. And then we're going to put another graph in here. Let's put a little graph in here. And then we're going to draw a line. We'll use um, R is a radius. So let's see. What color can I use? Oh, let's use white. And we're going to set that angle to 45 degrees, like this. <laughs> now the radius is a unit one. It's always going to be equal, it's going to be equal to one all the way around. And there's an angle in here called theta, and that's the angle from from zero up to whatever that angle is. We know the angle is 45 degrees. So and then you have um, another line that comes down. And we could probably use red. Maybe I'll use a darker color of red. Like that. Now. The sine of the angle is the opposite over, or the tangent of that angle is the opposite over the, it's the, it's the y over the x. That's the tangent value. The sine is the opposite over um, the hypotenuse, and the cosine is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. Let me just go ahead and... Look at this here. R sine theta. The opposite, which is x. X is, oh now see, x they've got as cosine theta. What the fuck? All right, this is confusing me. Fuck off. Fuck off. Fuck off. I'm looking at this wiki page and, um. It's a little bit confusing the way they've got this here. Um. In what's called a Pythagorean theorem, you know that r squared, which is this, this radius number, this is r. Let's see if I can put this in here. Oh shit, it's the wrong color. Okay, that's the radius. Um, this is supposed to be the y value. This is the x value down here. And the y value is up here. Now the Pythagorean theorem states that r squared equals x squared plus y squared. r equals the square root of x squared plus y squared. Um, I think. And the angle, theta, the sine of that angle equals, see, I can't remember, fuck. I know the tangent is the opposite over the, uh, over the adjacent, okay? So if we're going halfway up this curve here and halfway, well, I don't even know where that line is. I know this is 45 degrees. 
So it doesn't look proportionately on the graph. It's supposed to be halfway. Um, those distances are 0.5. So if I take 0.5 over 0.5, it's going to give me 1. The tangent of 1 is going to give me some figure. And I'll have my calculator handy. Um, let's see. Tangent of 1. The tangent of 1, it says here it's 1.55. supposed to be it's supposed to be the arc tangent of one wait a minute let's see here a r arc tangent of one okay so the arc tangent of one is 45 degrees um, it's it's T A N to the minus one power will give you the angle of that of that whatever that angle is. T it's it's t it's T A N minus one. I probably should write that down. Um, let's do it in white here. So you've got, it's going to be hard to do. You've got the T. The tangent minus 1 is 45 degrees. You can't really see it on there for some reason, um, and I'm going to fix that. Uh, let's see what we've got here. Um, sorry about that. And that's not showing up there either. There we go. Now the radius is going to be, um, I think that's, it's it's going to be uh, 0 0.5. It's the square root of 0.5 squared times. We know what these distances are. Where's the calculator? Uh, let's see here. So we've got 0.5 squared, which is 0.25. So if I do 0.5 and shut x2. 0.25 okay so so we got 0.25 plus 0.25 is 0.5 but we want to take the square root of that so we go square root 0.5 equals 0 0.7071 that's the number I'm looking for that is the approximate distance of R at 45 degrees. Wait a minute, that can't be right. That's supposed to be 1. Um, the radius is supposed to be equal to 1. Well, if the radius is equal to 1, and if the radius is equal to 1, the angle is, um, they're both going to be the same, so I'm going to get confused. 
I probably should have done uh, a 3060 degree. That's what I should have done. I'm not going to do that. Actually, let me think. In my, I'm going to do it in my head. If we do a 3060, uh, meaning 30 degrees and 60 degree triangle with the y value being the shorter value we know that the the shorter angle is 35 degrees in other words if the y value is shorter we know i know that the angle is 30 degrees and i still know that the radius is equal to 1 so if i take the sine of um if I take the sine of 30 degrees and multiply it by 1, wait, it doesn't make any sense, does it? Oh, it's a 3, 4, it, Pythagorean theorem is a 3, 4, 5, so it's 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared. That's the Pythagorean uh, formula, and I can prove it, let's see. So if I do 3 squared plus... 4 squared equals 25. The square root of 25 is 5. Um, so now there's only one answer for y. We know y is a smaller value. But I can't remember. I'm trying to think of it in my head. Well, we could do... I'll say I can't do tangent. Tangent minus 1 because I don't know both the values. Oh, yes, I do. Wait. No, I don't. Let, I'm going to have to look this up now. Because that wiki page is not... It's not helpful. It's not helping me at all. Hello. I need to have the the angles in here. <coughs> okay. Um, see, that still is not giving me. It says x equals r times the cosine of theta. Yeah, but the cosine of theta is the opposite. Sine of theta equals the opposite over the hypotenuse. Okay, that, that I know is true. Okay, so the sine of theta is the opposite over the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse in this case is r. Um, so we multiply r times the sine of theta, and we get that y value. So if I go to my online calculator, we take the sine of 45 degrees. Uh, this, let's see, sine 45 equals, uh, that's not correct. It's not 0.85. Cosine of 45. Uh, it must be doing radians. Wait. We need to be in degrees. Alright, so the sine of 45 degrees is 0.7071. Okay. So that means that the x and y values that we have in our graph of the circle is equal to 0 0.7071. That was the number that I was looking for. Um, well, if that's the case, then that means that x and y coordinate is 0 0.7071, isn't it? I 
I probably should write that down, shouldn't I? So we've got an x and a y coordinate, and both values equal 0.7071. Um, so I go point seven oh seven one, and then you have a comma point seven. Your X Shit. X. Sorry, my letters are not very good here. This is Y. This is your X and Y coordinate of that point right there on that circle. Um, I could just make a little. Oh, why is it red? Fuck. That's that coordinate. Now, what we need to do is we need to convert the X and Y coordinate from the Cartesian system into the polar coordinate. And the reason for doing that is... Um, I believe the polar coordinate system is what transfers the sine wave in the Cartesian system to the circle in the coordinate in the polar coordinate system. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure about that. So y equals. Um, wait, that's not the way to remember this. The way to remember this, the sine of theta equals the opposite over the hypotenuse. So if we write down um, we write down, let's say I want to use a different color, see sine of theta, huh? We could use two, well let's see, what if I used blue Let's use blue for the sine of theta. The sine of theta equals, in our case, it's y. over r. And I don't really have a lot of room in here. And the cosine of theta, i got to pick a color. Um, the cosine of theta going to be equal to my x doesn't look very good it's a sad x but hey x over r <coughs> and there's a reason for needing to know this so now what we have is we have um, let me go back to my, my, uh, my polar coordinates thing here. It says x equals r times the cos cosine of theta. x equals r times the cosine of theta, which is correct. <coughs> the polar coordinates r and, f and, phi can be converted to co Cartesian coordinates by using trig functions. The Cartesian coordinates can be converted to blah, 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 blah. <coughs> Let's 
saying that theta equals that value. Polar equation of the curve. Just showing a circle. The general equation of a circle with the center at such is this is an equation I've never seen before in my life. I do not freaking know what this is. Not a clue. Not a clue. They're doing a bunch of stuff in uh, um, in this polar coordinates wiki that's very confusing. Every complex number can be represented as a point in a complex plane. So, uh, and therefore can be expressed by specifying either the point's car Cartesian coordinates or the point's polar coordinates, called polar form. The complex number Z can be represented in rectangular form. Z equals X plus I, Y. I is an imaginary number, which is equal to minus 1. I is an imaginary unit. And from there, Z equals R times cosine of theta times uh, plus I times the sine of theta. And those are added together and, mul and multiplied by R. And from there, we have the form Z equals R to the E, I, and theta, where E is Euler's number which are equivalent as shown in Euler's formula. Euler's, and they call it Euler. I call it Euler. Note that this formula, like all those involving exponentials of angles, assume that the angle theta is represented in radians. Uh, why they're doing differential calculus of these form, I don't know. They're getting into the area. Now, this is something that I was talking about uh, with another professor. I was wanting to understand the Jacobian. So here it says, using Cartesian coordinates, an infinitesimal area element can be calculated as uh, the derivative of the area times the derivative of x and y. The substitution rule for multiple Integral states that when using other coordinates, the Jacobian determinant of the coordinate conversion formula has to be considered. <laughs> the Jacobian is equal to the deter determinant of of the integral. I mean, of the dif differential of x and y over the differential of y r r theta. Uh, running that information into the matrix derives cosine theta minus r sine theta and sine theta plus r cosine theta equals r cosine, r cosine squared theta plus r sine squared theta equals r. Uh, then it goes on, then it goes on and continues. Um, vector calculus can also be applied to polar coordinates. Um, they're talking about the Gaussian integral, which is actually a little different. It's interesting, but it's different. And there's some stuff in here that it seems to be, it's like it's discombobulated. Um... So that means if we have sine theta times r equals y, and I'm trying to I'm trying to get into the polar coordinate system. How the hell do I do that? X equals r times the cosine of theta. The polar coordinates are, isn't this r, they're calling it phi, whatever this number is, 
phi is the arc tangent 2 of y and x. Cartesian coordinates x and y can be converted to polar coordinates r and phi with r greater than or equal to 0 and phi in the interval of between minus pi and pi. What is this? Yeah, hello. A tan 2 is a common variation of the arctangent function defined as follows. Arctangent of y over x if x is greater than 0. Arctangent of y over x plus pi if x is greater than 0 and y is equal to or greater than 0. An angle in the range of 0, comma, 2 pi may be obtained by adding 2 pi to the value in case it's negative. Okay, there's actually there's actually a graphic here that might be interesting. Uh, let me see if I can go ahead and... Oh, is that going to confuse things? Y equals sine of 6x plus 2. Oh, uh, that is rather interesting. That is rather interesting. Let me bring that up and see if I can make heads or tails out of this. Uh, let's see. Let's go back to... Let me drop programs. And we'll bring back up visuals. Is that... Or is it web page? Web page? Um, if you look over in the right hand corner, right on top of my head, it's kind of hard to see. It's going to start out with the sine wave that's up at the top here. And it's raised by two, uh, two values. It's mapped onto r equals sine of 6 theta plus 2. That's what that curve looks like in polar form. Why are they adding 2 to it, though? So in polar form, it must just be a circle, a sine wave. That's really freaky how they flip that over like that r theta equals so okay so here you have y equals 6x plus 2 no 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 that's not right y equals the sine of x plus 2 r theta equals 6 sine of 6 theta times plus 2 y equals sine of 6x plus 2 R of theta equals sine of 6 theta plus 2. R of theta equals... R of theta equals the sine of theta. R of theta equals the sine of theta. Click for details. Yeah, I'm clicking. Huh. I don't know why they're flipping it there. It's a little bit confusing. Well, it would be. I can't remember a lot of this stuff. I do know um, that I'm wanting to get to this form which is z equals x plus y.
Um, and there's an imaginary number here. And I think that imaginary number depends on where this, a graph has four quadrants. I'm getting I'm getting a little bit further away than what I want to get into. Why am I doing this? I say I wanted to get into something else. This is not helping me. Um, let me drop this web page. So let me bring up programs again. So. Um, y equals r times the sine of theta. So I multiply r. What if it's just, uh, what if there's no x value? What if it's uh, like the square wave here? <coughs> It's still a, it's still it's still radians. It's just I'm just curious. I I don't know, you know I I just can't figure this shit out. This is really basic stuff too, and I can't remember it. It's supposed to be y equals, so y equals sine of theta times r. Yeah, 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 I know. I'm supposed to have some D. We have to convert to radians, okay? So, <coughs> that's the first thing. Um, it's, one, it's 180. It's pi over 180. What the hell is, what the hell is that formula? We have to convert the angle to radians. Um, how do I do that? Bear with me for a minute. Let's see. Angle to radians. So the number of degrees, this is where, this is what we want to get into. So if we have a number, let's not have fucking bird. I'll say if we have a number that's, uh, actually it could be theta. Okay, theta is in degrees. equals and now we've got an x and a y <coughs> the x values are going to be and this is going to be 2 These are the x values in a perfect sine wave with this this radius. Um, in the x and y, it would be one, I guess. I don't know, but but this is pi. Just take my word for it. This is half pi. This is pi. This is three quarter pi down at the bottom and two pi. So a complete cycle goes through two pi radians. So degrees is going to equal to um, 
Is it pi over 180? Shit. Multiply the number of degrees by pi over 180. So we're going to have pi, which is yellow, divided by 180, which in a sense is also yellow, but actually in this case is white. So. So if we've got 45 degrees, like we said over here, and we multiply 45 degrees times 180, that's going to give us, wait, what? No, I did this wrong. I did something wrong. the angle is supposed to be you're supposed to be multiply this times 45 and that gives you the answer in radians so let me go let me see here um, let me try this eraser it's not working why the fuck is that not working Oh, I'm erasing. Wait. No, it's just color. We'll get there, people. It's nice to learn stuff as you teach, you know. All right, so we're going to have... What we need to have is we need the angle times pi over 180 equals and then we could have some other strange color over here um, and now I don't have any room for it <laughs> and and my 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 picture is in the way equals All right, let me go back to my little thing here. Uh, where's my webcam? All right, so that angle, 45 degrees, is multiplied times pi over 180 to give you the number in radians, to give you your answer in radians. So if I go to my web page and go to my calculator and I clear this and I do 45, um times three point one four one five nine equals divided by one eight zero equals now I have point seven eight five point seven eight six radians. That's weird. One degree is equivalent to pi 180 over radians. Multiply the number of degrees you work with uh, to convert it to radian terms. So let's go back to polar coordinates. And It's been so freaking long since I've worked with radians. Hmm. 
The value of v above is the principal value of the complex number argument applied to x plus i, y. An angle in the range of 0 to 2 pi may be obtained by adding 2 pi to the line in case it's negative, etc., etc., etc. Um... R equals six theta, sine of six theta. Is that in radians? It has to be. R equals the sine of that number. So if I go back and take the sine of that number, point seven eight five. Can I put that in memory? No, that's in radians. So I got to go back to radius. 0 0.785, 0 0.7854. So if I clear this, go back to radians, take the sine of 0 0.7854, it should give me 45 degrees. It doesn't. It gives me it gives me um, 0 0.7071, which is the sine of uh, 45 degrees in xy coordinates. What did I do wrong? Is it the arc sine? The sine of it said it should equal the it should equal r, but we're actually figuring out x. I think somebody's contacting me that I don't particularly want to be contacted. I gotta go, I gotta look. <coughs> I gotta call it quits here pretty quick. Oh good, it was somebody else. Oh shit, I gotta do that other thing. <gasps> I almost forgot about it. Holy shit, I gotta get that done. Yes, I will get back to you momentarily. I am busy. I was supposed to do something else. I almost, I almost totally forgot about it. Okay, so if we, if we go to the original formula and say the sine of 45 degrees in xy coordinates is the sine of 0 0.7071. If we do the sine of that other number that I just used in radians, it's the same thing. Um, so I was just, so that that's that part of it. Uh, so then the question is, so in other words, um, So now I'm looking at the square wave. This is each each one of these things has has a has a uh, shit. Let me go look at my. Let's see. Sine wave. Equation. Okay, so now what we've got is so here's 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 what we're getting at. This is what we're getting at. Okay, um, the actual sine wave equation has time involved. So we're actually looking at this this pi and and um, I gotta write this whole freaking equation down. This is this is weird. Why do I have to do this? I know this is the right formula though. K is the wave number. 
k minus w t plus what? And is the phase of the sine wave given in radians? Well, the phase is usually zero. A, y of x comma t is equal to a times the sine of wait a minute what the hell let me look at this okay this is a much better view here let me go into my web page maybe we can get to it from there let's see web page so what we got here is this formula y sub t equals a times the sine of 2 pi times f t f is the frequency um, and t is the time this is actually equal to a, a number called uh, fuck I can't remember the name of it it's not omega it's this w number I can't remember what the fuck it's called a equals sine of wt plus phi. This phi number is dependent on whether it's related to zero, like how far away it's related, it's from zero. Angular frequency, w equals 2 pi f. So there's a, rep a visual representation of See how he's going counterclockwise? They're just so they're showing uh, 1.7. Well, I'm not going to get into that. That's crazy. Um, but I don't understand. They're saying that pi and 2 pi are now equal to t. Look at this graph over here. Illustrating the cosine wave's fundamental relationship to the circle. That's what I was trying to do. Oh, that's just fucking freaky. Wait a minute, so... I see what's going on here. You see where x now has the value of r cosine theta and y has the value of r sine theta. You see how the x is the up and down and the y is now across and t as a function of time as this thing is cruising along here. It's still a sine wave, okay? It's on one plane. But now, so the polar coordinate is a slice in time of the x and y values it's 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 converting it but now we can we can take these numbers and we can go 
uh, r equals cosine of so it's it's phi now because this is in radians this is in radians these numbers I never really understood the polar graph. I mean, why does there have to be an x value? Why can't it just be y equals r times the sine of theta? Here they've got the graph going around con uh, clockwise. Wish there was a way to stop that. Uh oh, I just b broke it. So. It's kind of a three-dimensional representation. It's like a slice in time. That's strange, though. I don't understand the relevance of exactly what's happening there. Traveling and standing waves. Yeah. I don't know. I'm trying to imagine it to myself. Like I can make, I can design the fractal patterns, and I can design them in, in uh, two-dimensional pictures. But what what's really happening is, uh, I still don't know what this picture is. The square wave to polar. You know what I mean? It's so for a period of time. Wait, it's at the beginning. This is zero. This is uh, x and y. This is zero one, and it stays at zero one for a period of time. If I, if I take the derivative, one of them is going to be zero and the other one's going to be infinity. See, this is the other thing that's interesting me about infinity. Like, how do you get from point A to point B? Um, you can never really get there. So, so then the circle is a representative of, a, of some, p like in this lower left-hand corner, at 45 degrees, let's say, which is, we know that 45 degrees is going to be, um, no, wait, that's 180. This is 90. So 45 degrees on this graph is right here. Um, I lost my train of thought. That's the same as this position here. So in the radian form, it's just going to be this dot, then it's going to be up here, <laughs> then it's going to be over here, maybe it's just going to be a square, maybe it's going to look like... Um, Let's see if I do this color. 
So it's going to start over here at some point in time. Then it's going to go, I think it's going to go up for that period of time. Maybe it's just a line. No, it can't be. Maybe it looks like that. I don't know. It's crazy. It's a slice in time is what it is, according to that. So we would have to take, we would have to take um, y equals the sine of theta and just the sine of zero. So it's either going to be equal to one or infinity. So if it equals infinity, that's a problem. It's almost like you can't plot it. You can't plot this on a polar graph. So the thing with fractals, if I do, if I go ahead and do a new, a new, uh, actually, I could save this. Oh, uh, let's see. I'll just save it there. And I'm going to go, let's see here. Oh, uh, the thing with fractals. We have an equation such as, oops, damn it, why is it still there? I don't want C equals, um, Z squared plus C. Let me look at, let me look up, um, um, what the hell is that? No, it wasn't doing that. Eigenbound constants. of x equals a minus x squared. Ratio of column converges to the Feigenbaum constant. The same number arises for the logistic map. So it's the function of z equals z. The Feigenbaum constant erases the diameters, etc., etc., etc. Z square. It's, it's crazy, I swear to God. It's supposed to be Z squared. Plus C. Now, z, um, you could say that z equals, oh, uh, shit. z can equal, let's put a question mark. Um, Polar 
coordinates. Z equals X plus I Y. C equals X plus God damn it. I Y. This is the polar coordinate system. It's a slice in time. And I don't know how to relate that to this Feigenbaum constant because that formula which is the which is the easiest um, it's actually the logistic map is what we're talking about function of x equals ax parentheses 1 minus x with a function of z az function so function of z Z equals A is it A X? A Oh no, I did something wrong. This is supposed to be... Fuck. This is one... Minus... X... AX times 1 minus X. It says it's yellow. This is white. Now, this Z value is actually um, equal to X. What, what this is, this is called an iteration. And so you do this, you put it, you plug in a number for X and you, you run it through this computer program and you run it a thousand times and if it doesn't go into infinity or if it recycles itself, then you can start making the plots. Um, So I think what we're actually doing here when we're plotting these when we're plotting these uh, these attractors we're doing them over time so if we if we're doing them over time if we're saying if we're saying that y um, now we've got x and y This is this is over time now. What this actually looks like is like it goes up like this. 
I should have do it higher. Right, just forget that line. Put it like this. And then it splits. Then it splits again. Then it splits again. Um. This is called. That's what that's what this looks like. But if you do, if you were to draw this on a graph, um, I'm just gonna throw this together real quick. And and you draw another a straight line like this. And then what happens is this thing comes up here like oh shit it comes up here and then it kind of swings back and forth like this and it settles in on uh, some number this might be this might be I don't I don't know if it is this might be the X the the X Y representation this is the uh, Y is a function of do I do that x comma t I think so x comma I believe that's what this is. So every time this iterates down here, time goes by. So you've got, you got T equals one, two, three, you know, it just goes on and on and on. So it's there, but it's not in the equation. And what happens is this video that I watched takes this this equation right here and converts it into the Mandelbrot set. Now, this is one of the things that I want to prove. And what you're actually looking at when you see this yellow line right here, this is like... Uh, this, what you're seeing is you're looking at this from the top down. So this is actually this, this, uh, let me see, this stuff here, all of this, all this stuff here that goes on into infinity is down here on this yellow line. It's down here. And down here on this graph, you're looking at it edge on. Now, all of a sudden, things happen here. This right here, uh, I'm plot, plot it in blue. That is the Mandelbrot set. So it just starts out from this line. There's all kinds of noise here, and then it flips over to the Mandelbrot set. Personally, I have a hard time believing that. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. 
But the thing that I wanted to, I really wanted to get into, and I still haven't done it yet. Um, shit, let me just put that in there. All right, let me go back to my pen here and try to do this quickly because I got to get done. All right, we've got this curve again. Um, and we got, say we got, uh, uh, let's see if I do, the Henon Attractor, okay, is actually, um, you've got Y. as a function of t and then you've got x shit again as a function of t and that doesn't look like a t so let me get a t um when we do the graph When we do the graph, we're plotting, we're plotting this equation that kind of looks like this. And this is y, oh shit. And this, this is X. But what I wanted to get into is that you can rotate this thing. And I think I might be able to find it on here. Let me see if I can find it really quick. Um... And let me go to my shit. There was one, damn it, and I don't remember where the hell it is. Wait, isn't this? This is it. Fuck, this is stupid. There was one way you could rotate it, and I don't remember where the fuck it is. Maybe it's not. Um, maybe it's the Lorenz attractor? Interactive Lorenz Attractor. All right, this is a little different one. It's a little bit fucked. Hide butterflies. Excellent, I found one. Good, 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 good. Lucky, lucky me. All right, so let's go. Let's go back here and bring up the web page. And what we got here. This is called the Lorenz Attractor. It's it's like the butterfly thing, okay? So what you're looking at, when we draw this in our computer program, these are X and Y values, okay? But there's something rather strange that I never really paid much attention to, and I'm trying to understand this, is that even though it's X and Y values, there's something else going on here. Prepare to be fucking amazed. Now watch this. Hello? 
this is a three-dimensional image. The question is, how do you get a three-dimensional image from x, y coordinates? Three dimensions is x, y, and z. So here's this would be, let's say, for example, it might be a completed object from point whatever to point whatever. It, doesn't, it goes on to infinity. It keeps repeating itself. But we can stop it at a certain point. Then we can render this into a musical composition. How would we do that? How would you... So then you've got to ask yourself, okay, first of all, it's not X, Y. And it's not X, Y, Z. If this is a polar representation of... Because what we were talking about, converting... Um, X and Y coordinates to polar coordinates, we're actually looking at slices in time. So, in effect, time becomes the third dimension. Um, or maybe it doesn't. I don't, I don't freaking know. But I do know that this is obviously a three-dimensional object in some, in some form. And... Um, the question is how to represent that in a musical form, number one, and then number two, how to represent it so that it's, um, it has some intrinsic value. Um, And I think we, so that's why we went into this whole thing about looking at the sine wave because music is, is a bunches of sine waves and harmonics and, and all of that sort of thing. Um, you know, could we be looking at harmonics? Could we be looking at, uh, then, when you, then when you increase the frequency, you have to have the correct pitch so that it sounds correct. You can't just go, you know, willy-nilly and say such and such a level is such and such a, you know, whatever. We'd have to come up with um, the sound that's on a keyboard. We'd have to make sure that the pitch is, this, is correct between the octaves. Or is everything going to play in one octave? You know? Um, we could say that these things have, where's the origin? You know, the origin is in the middle of this somewhere you know it starts in the middle and works its way around then it comes back around over here this is called the Lorenz attractor um, and it baffles the hell out of me because when I when I first drew these I was looking at this and saying wow this thing looks like a three-dimensional picture but I could never turn it I could never you know I couldn't do this right here. Um, so the question is how to render this in, in musical form. You know, how do we... You can't go from left to right. If you went from left to right, um, there's a plus and minus Z factor that's happening. You know, it looks like two records, doesn't it? Just It's fucking crazy. What is this? So I don't know what these butterflies are. I don't need that. Hide curves. Now here we can change these values. And um uh, can see the effects that it has. What if we were to look at the three-dimensional aspect of it and see? So no matter what we do here, 
there's always this three-dimensional aspect. And that, that three-dimensional aspect has to do with time. Um, variations on the Pythagoras tree. Crazy shit there, huh? Anyway, um, that's where I'm at. So we've learned about, so going, go, getting back to what we learned about. What did we learn? Uh, let's get rid of. Uh, what the hell am I getting rid of? Oh, my webcam. What the fuck is in here? I'm getting tired. Programs. So, we've learned about going from octave to octave. The, the tuning has to be changed in order to keep the same pitch I don't understand that that's that's the first thing we're gonna do we're gonna make sure that when we change the frequencies in the program that the tuning is correct for each of the notes so I can say I can create a curve I can create an XY curve and saying going from from zero up to a certain value Let's say that our, our fractal is going to exist within certain range of octaves, let's say four or five octaves. Then I can, I can say that from zero to Y max is going to be, is going to follow a curve. Um, so we need to draw a curve for, um, I wonder if that's actually a thing. Uh, let's see, what if I put in um, octave pitch tuning curve. Octave stretching phenomena with complex tones. I don't know what that is. Piano tuning. Stretched tuning. How to use a piano meter software. Uh, what's this? Create a new tuning file, simple harmonics, rough tuning. Was this a video? The purpose of this video is to introduce some of the basic features of the Piano Meter app. Mm -hmm. As you can see, there are various indicators showing the pitch of a note. In the center, you have a numerical readout of the pitch in cents. The dial above also displays this information. Behind the dial, you have multiple strobe wheels that spin based on how sharp or flat a note is. The strobe spins counterclockwise if the note is flat, or clockwise if the note is sharp. When the note is in tune, the strobe <coughs> stops. Depending on which note is being played, there may be multiple strobe wheels, each one for a different harmonic that is present in the complex tone of a piano. So now, I can do the same thing, and we can use individual tones. We don't have to worry about the harmonics. This might be a good app to use, and maybe I'll... Uh, I'll leave this page up. I don't know if this is free or not. Pro version. New tuning file or load save file. Pro version only. I don't care about that.
By default, the app will automatically detect and switch to whichever note is being played. However, in some cases, you may want to change the note detection mode. This is done with the slider on the left. In auto or jump mode, the app will detect and jump to any note anywhere on the piano. In stepwise mode, the app will only make small chromatic steps to notes that are close to the current note, but won't make large jumps. I'm only interested in the actual tuning. Uh, this would be a, a visualization program. Lock mode prevents the app from switching notes altogether. In any of the modes, you can change the note by touching the desired note on the keyboard at the bottom of the screen. There are also hidden buttons to the right and left of the center indicator that let you step the note up and down by half steps or by octaves. These buttons are always active, but remain invisible until you actually use them. At the bottom of the screen, there is a graphing area that shows the tuning curve that the app has calculated for your piano, as well as small dots representing the measured pitch of each note. On this graph, you can imagine equal temperament as a horizontal line through the middle of the graph. The vertical scale of the graph ranges from negative 50 to plus 50 cents and you can see the upper notes of the piano are stretched sharp of equal temperament and the lower notes are stretched flat, which is what you would expect for a typical piano tuning. By swiping to the left or right, you reveal two other graphs. On the left, you have a frequency spectrum graph that shows the acoustic power for all the frequencies over the range oh, of the piano. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Is that real? For example, if I play A2, I would expect to see multiple peaks in the spectrum, one for each harmonic of A2. It looks like his microphone's coming through there or something. There should be a peak at 110 hertz, another at 220 hertz, another at 330 hertz, another at 440 hertz, and so on up the harmonic series for A2. Oh, that's really cute. That's the relative strength of each harmonic is what determines the timbre, or tone quality, of a note. In the low bass, you'll notice that the lowest harmonics are often This is not missing. just a sine wave, it's this a... This is normal. It's like the sound of a Swiping piano, right which has got other sounds in it. Graph. Each dot on this graph represents the inharmonicity of one note on the piano, and the line represents a best fit that can be used to interpolate the inharmonicity for notes that haven't been measured yet. Typically, the inharmonicity is lowest in the tenor region, where the strings are long but aren't as thick as the strings in the low bass. The inharmonicity is greatest in the high treble, where the string's stiffness to length ratio is large. Let's create a new tuning file. You do this from the main menu, which you open with the button in the upper left corner of the screen. Just for fun, let's name this tuning file. By default, the app starts with a generic tuning curve. This will change dramatically as we start to measure inharmonicity. At the beginning of the tuning, it's important to sample the I never heard that across word. the range of the piano to generate an appropriate tuning curve. The more notes you sample, the more accurate the tuning curve will be. All right, well, I gotta stop. Um, so anyway, anyway, we learned about tuning and pitch, and we were lear we learned about um, the 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 Lorenz attractor, the other one there. So the next time that I come on here, which I'm not sure when, I'm gonna be setting up a computer program to program this stuff, and then I'm. I think there's a way I can pro program MIDI, um, but MIDI doesn't control, if I used, yeah, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but anyway, you got to start somewhere, you know, and this is where, this is where I'm starting, um, just to, uh, I'm trying to get this layman's point of view about how all of this stuff fits in, it's not easy, I'll tell you that right now, but hey, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. I got my eye on you.